All right, guys. So let's go ahead and look at the escalation of the Vietnam War. So last week, we kind of looked at the beginning phases of the war uh, with Kennedy sending advisors and then the Gulf of Tonkin resolutions. Let's go back just one second real quick, rehash a little bit of that, and then we'll go into the meat and potatoes today, which is going to be the real escalation of the war and then the major events of the war. Okay, so it's November 22nd, 1963, and President Kennedy is assassinated. Now, this momentous event is going to ha play a very large role on the war because it's going to put President Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson, in control of the country. Now, when Johnson takes power, um, a lot starts to happen in Vietnam. I wouldn't say he deviated a ton from what Kennedy would have done, at least at the beginning, although later on, uh, Johnson would become kind of the president that was most linked with the Vietnam War, along with, along with Nixon later on. So, JFK is assassinated, and now we have LBJ. So, he continued to do what he thought JFK would have done. He kept the same advisors, kept the same cabinet, and continued with escalating the war like JFK did. Now, if you guys remember from last week when I talked about this, uh, for a lot of the presidents in uh, in the Vietnam War, their main idea, their main kind of goal, was to not be the president that lost Vietnam, right? And so they essentially kind of kicked the can down the road in order to make sure that they would not be the presidents that were blamed with Vietnam falling to the communists. So under LBJ, Okay, uh, in 1964, he essentially goes in and claims that we're not going to escalate U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Okay, so he gets reelected. However, in reality, once the Gulf of Tonkin incidents and the Gulf of Tonkin resolution happened, which we talked about last week, once those things happened, this essentially gave him the green light to do so without congressional approval and essentially without the approval of the U.S. citizens, right? Because Congress, in theory, is supposed to be um, representing the American citizens. Now, you know, if you're cynical like I am, then you'll you'll realize that that's not always true. But either way, LBJ didn't have to truly listen to Congress or the people with the beginning of the Vietnam War because he could do what he wanted. Um, his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, which is a very famous figure of the Vietnam War, had we not been, you know, sent home, uh, I think we'd be able to watch a really cool documentary which looks at his role in the war, and it's it was done in 2000, I think, 10, 2011. So it's him being interviewed much, much later on, kind of talking about what happened during the war and kind of how he's reflecting on it now. Either way, he's responsible for a lot of the advice given to uh, President Johnson during the war. Uh... The Gulf Tonkin incident gives him the green light, the blank check, the resolution allows him to do what he wants, and now we're fully into the escalatory period of the war. Now, here's a quick map to kind of understand the major points here. So, Vietnam is divided in two, as you can see. We have North Vietnam, the capital being Hanoi, right here, and then we have South Vietnam, the capital being Saigon. South Vietnam controlled by the non-communists, North Vietnam controlled by the communists. Laos and Cambodia also play a big role here because the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which you can see here in red, was basically a supply line used by the North to get supplies into the South to the Viet Cong, who were people already in the South, but supported by the North, fighting against the South Vietnamese. So it's a little confusing, right? You have the Viet Minh, that's the army of Vietnam, North Vietnam. You have the Viet Cong, which are the people in the South, supporting and supported by the North, right? Uh, and they're in South Vietnam, and they're being supplied by the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So, uh, there's kind of two aspects to the war in Vietnam. The first is the air war. So, like I said, the U.S. didn't want to get too involved in North Vietnam, because, again, if we go back a second, right, North Vietnam borders with China. And just like in Korea, when China got involved, when the U.S. got too close to its borders, the U.S. was afraid of another Chinese intervention. And so what they did was instead of invading North Vietnam, they just bombed it, okay? Uh, this was called Operation Rolling Thunder, uh, which started on March 2nd, 1965, uh, during which there was just ongoing bombing, especially of Hanoi, uh, as well as other targets in North Vietnam, uh, mostly targets along the Ho Chi Minh Trail as well. And they were just constantly dropping bombs after bomb after bomb on North Vietnam, okay? Okay. 
Uh, these were the first kind of casualties of the Vietnam War, were the downed pilots, pilots who were shot down and captured. Uh, they became prisoners of war and uh, were kept in North Vietnam, sometimes for up to seven years, if not more, um, when they were captured. They also used uh, napalm, which is essentially kind of a, a jellified fire, for lack of a better term. Basically, what they would do is they would drop this napalm over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and it would just burn the forest down, because most of the trail was hidden by the forest. And so by doing so, they could... In theory, they could figure out where the trails were, and so they could actually stop the supply going from the north to the south. In reality, though, because of the type of warfare that was being fought, it wasn't people wearing, you know, North Vietnamese uniforms. It was peasants being paid a little bit to go do this for the North Vietnamese, mostly. And, and therefore, any sort of attack using napalm was also going to bring the risk of, of impacting civilians. And that's beyond just the you know ecological destruction brought on by it. This is something that was really a heavy, uh, a source of heavy criticism for the United States was the use of napalm. Okay. Uh, here we see a very famous photo from the Vietnam War. Uh, they dropped napalm on this uh, town in South Vietnam. And uh, they thought it was uh, an outpost of Viet Cong soldiers, and there may have been some, but there are also just a lot of families and kids, and a lot of people were burned by the napalm. And this photo, this photo was shown across the world, and it really brought on a lot of anti-U.S. sentiment across the world about what was happening in South Vietnam. The goal of Rolling Thunder was to raise the morale of the South Vietnamese by showing, hey, we're destroying the northern supply lines, we're fighting for you guys, we're going to help win the war. But in reality, it didn't work, right? You, you can't win a country over by bombing it, and you can't control a piece of territory just by bombing it. And so, in reality, Rolling Thunder didn't, didn't work. And so that led to ground forces being used in the South. Uh, they still wanted to keep the war localized to a degree. If they if they send troops to the north, the fear was that China or the USSR would get involved. And so what they did instead was they sent ground troops into the south to fight the Viet Cong, but this also didn't end the war like they hoped. Okay. And so we see here some uh, criticism of the war. These are some political cartoons, right? Here we see increased bombing will stop the infiltration. Increased bombing will break Hanoi's morale. Just one more step in the bombing. So I want you guys to, in your Google Doc, just answer real quick, what is the message of this political cartoon? Okay. Uh, here we see the deployment of troops. This is ground troops in Vietnam, right? So through 64, it's pretty small, but then by 65, 66, 67, 68, we see a huge increase in the number of American troops being sent to Vietnam. The ground war, um, a couple important aspects here. There are no territorial goals uh, because... In theory, South Vietnam was already controlled by the U.S., right? It was already controlled by our allies and by us. So we weren't trying to, you know, capture a city or whatever. We were just trying to defeat the Viet Cong, but we didn't know how, how we were going to defeat the Viet Cong. So it became a thing of body count. And so essentially every day, right, on the TV, you would watch the news and the news would say, hey, today, you know, 100 Viet Cong soldiers were killed, 200 Viet Cong soldiers were killed. And so the idea was, if we killed more of them than they killed of us, we would win the war. But that's not, you know, that's that's not a very good way to justify a war, and to, and to or not really justify it, but to kind of measure if you're winning a war, right? But this kind of speaks to the difficulty of fighting the war, in which there were no, you know, uniformed soldiers for the Viet Cong. We weren't trying to capture North Vietnam. We were trying to contain communism, right, and stop it from spreading to South Vietnam. And so... Essentially, this war turned into something that the U.S. really couldn't win. Uh, it's also important to note that this was the first quote-unquote living room war because this is when TVs became really available to most Americans. TVs had emerged in the 50s and 60s, early 50s, or early 60s, sorry, but by the 60s, mid-60s, they became actually affordable to most Americans. And so most Americans could actually follow what was happening on TV and they could see the impact of it right away. They were being shown footage and stuff. And the news, the media was given unprecedented access to the war, much more than they would be given today, which really gave the Americans a very honest depiction of the war and led to a lot of anti-war sentiment by many Americans.
So there are kind of conflicting strategies amongst the people in the U.S., people in the government, right? There are some people who kept saying, well, let's keep escalating, right? Let's keep getting involved, send more troops, and we have to keep doing this because we can't lose Vietnam. Whereas on the flip side, there are people who said, well, Asia's none of our business. Let's get out of it. Let's do nothing. So again, I'd like you guys, whoops, sorry, to look at this cartoon. We have the guy here saying escalate. There's no substitute for victory. And then this guy sticking his head in a box of sand saying repent. Asia's none of our business. And as you can see in this cartoon, it's making fun of both of these strategies. So um, I'd like you guys to kind of talk about what do you think is the main message of this cartoon? What is the cartoon is trying to say about the conflicting strategies of the Vietnam War? So, like I said, one of the major difficulties of the war was that we didn't really know who the enemy was, right? We had the Viet Cong, who were farmers, uh, essentially, in the South, who supported the North and were being supported by the, the North. But they would fight at night, or they would fight in, in, in the hidden, essentially, right? They weren't wearing uniforms. They uh, used guerrilla warfare. Now, guerrilla warfare is not has nothing to do with guerrillas. There was a student who asked me about this a few years ago, saying, Wait, Mr. Senori, I didn't know we were fighting guerrillas. Um, we weren't, but guerrilla warfare is really just non-conventional warfare in which people aren't wearing uniforms, people aren't really uh, abiding by the traditional um, strategies of war, if you will. Okay, uh, They were willing to accept many, many casualties because, again, for them, this was not a war for communism. This was a war for liberation, right, essentially. Uh, and so they were willing to accept a lot of casualties, a loss of losses, because all they had to do was basically wait out the U.S. They didn't have to beat the U.S., they just had to wait them out. Uh, and we hugely underestimated their resolve and their resourcefulness and just how much they wanted to win. Because, again, for them, this wasn't just about communism. It was about freedom and independence, right? They had been a country controlled by others for thousands of years. It wasn't just about spreading the Cold War, right? They weren't some puppet of the USSR. And here's a, a famous quote from Mao Zedong. He says, the guerrilla wins if he does not lose, the conventional army loses if it does not win. And this is important because this is essentially what happened in Vietnam. We were the conventional army, we had to win, whereas the Vietnamese only, or the South Vietnamese, or sorry, the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh, they only had to not lose. They use uh, very, uh, you know, non-conventional strategies of dinky, of digging these bunkers and, and tunnels in which they would hide, right? They had these booby traps. They would be able to supply each other with food, with, you know, places to sleep. They even had uh, bicycle power generators for electricity, all in these net tunnels, network tunnels, sorry, these networks of tunnels. And essentially they could fight the war hidden, right? Whereas the U.S., we were, you know, we were wearing uniforms, we were fighting a very different style of warfare. Here we see some famous photos from the uh, from the war, and what really turns the war are the words of General Westmoreland in 1967. He says, "We can see the light at the end of the tunnel." In late 1967, but and here's a quote, right? The radio is saying, or a cartoon of the radio is saying, "The Viet Cong can't win," and the soldier says, "I hope the Viet Cong know this." But then what happens is the Tet Offensive in January of 1968, where the South Vietnamese, the, the Viet Cong, the Viet Minh, they invade South Vietnam and take every single South Vietnamese city. Okay, Now, at the end of the fighting that happens on the Tet Offensive, the U.S. actually defeats completely the Viet Minh and, great, and greatly weakens the Viet Cong. Okay? While defeating the Viet Cong was a positive thing, in reality, what this showed to the Americans was that the war was not almost over, like the U.S. Army had said. And so while this was in theory a win, or in reality was a win for the U.S. and the South Vietnamese, what it did do, from a media point of view, was it showed that the U.S. were lying about the war. And so the media portrays it as a defeat, and this ultimately really hurts the perception of the U.S. in the media. Okay. And here we see the people trying to kind of hide what happened. Uh, so you see, it's actually another victory for the U.S. because we have reason to think they really wanted to take California. So it kind of shows that they were lying about what was happening, and people became very skeptical of what the government was telling them. Johnson would basically say that he would not seek another, another term as president because this really kind of dampened people's support for him. 
All right, go ahead and continue on to part two for the rest of this lecture.